Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Robert Arai from University of Wisconsin and with my co-host Gian Banot, I would like to welcome you to the, I guess, fifth or sixth webinar, it depends on how we count because we had to uh, get one that's rescheduled for two weeks from today. Um, so uh, before we start, uh, I would just like for those who might be joining us for the first time, uh, just welcome you. Uh, just um, let you know that this is a regular webinar series every two weeks. Um, we are uh, highly encouraged to join us on the, at engage.aps.org. Uh, that's the community site where it allows also for discussion, etc. If you have any questions, here is the email. Uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, the um, website that uh, where the webinars are announced in, an, uh, in addition to other ones. I would really like to alert you to two things. One is the sign up because we're moving to a different way of announcing webinars uh, from the traditional way. Uh, and then the other one is to encourage you to join the CRG, which is the COVID Research and Resources Group within the APS. It's not close to the APS members only. So everybody is welcome to join and instructions are on the website. Uh, so if you if you want to join for the webinar announcements, that doesn't mean that you have to, uh, that uh, that just means that all the announcements will come to you. You'll still have to join and register for each webinar separately. Uh, you go to this uh, link um, and then uh, click the COVID Research and Resources webinar series. And uh, this is the Engage uh, website. Uh, and you see there, uh, there are uh, different um, announcements. Uh, for example, um, the, the CRG series and the series was announced in APS News, for example. Uh, we've got some, uh, some community announcements. And of course, we do announcements through this as well. Um, I would just like before I hand it over to today's uh, webinar, uh, we are having one more webinar this year. This will be on December 16. Uh, this is a webinar that we delayed uh, from a month ago, uh, but then we'll have a, a recess into winter break and we'll restart on Wednesday, January 29th. Uh, we have a, a, another a very, um, very strong lineup of speakers uh, already lined up. Uh, we'll start in Australia, then move to Europe. Uh, so the, the spring seminar series will be uh, much more um, international. Uh, but of course, the same um, exciting um, science that we'll be presenting. With that, I would like to um, hand it over to Adrian uh, to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Robert. It's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, webinar speaker, Jose Jimenez. Uh, Jose is a highly accomplished atmospheric scientist associated with or a faculty member of the University of Colorado uh, Chemistry Department at Boulder. He's also a fellow of the internationally renowned uh, Cyrus Institute there of Atmospheric Science. Uh, Jose has a, has a tremendous track record, uh, scientific track record as, as exemplified, for example, by his uh, high AIDS index of well over a hundred even on ISI, Google Scholar must be way higher than that even. Uh, considering he's way younger than, than many of us, uh, this is particularly impressive. Um, he's made many technological innovations, including uh, airborne or um, airplane type mass spectrometers for atmospheric sampling. And he, he really is, is a, a true atmospheric scientist. Uh, early on during the pandemic, he took an, a very active interest in uh, uh, COVID and COVID transmission. And um, he, he developed actually a very practical and very useful website uh, that many of you may have visited uh, that is uh, both a, a rich resource of all kinds of information, but it allows you to calculate how much exposure you might actually expect in a given environment. Uh, it's been, been highly popular, written up in many places, and um, he, he's done a lot of remarkable stuff. One quote, that one sentence that I'd like to, to finish with that I like particularly in one of his Medscape articles that he wrote, he, he says, relying on medical doctors for advice about aerosols is like relying on me, an aerosol scientist, for medical advice, just not a good idea. Uh, 
Jose, we're looking forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Adrian, for that introduction. And I certainly still agree with that statement. <laughs> People should not agree with him, <laughs> not rely on me for medical advice. Um, that wouldn't end up well. Okay, so hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, two, two topics, the modes of transmission, kind of what the science tell us and how do we know uh, what I will hope I'll, will, I'll convince you of that uh, that this is mainly a disease that's transmitted through aerosols. And then some about how to protect ourselves. I'll, I'll talk much more about the first because I think that's the key. Once people are convinced or are, you know, or, or reasonably convinced that this is a strong possibility that there is a transmission through aerosols, protecting ourselves is not rocket science, you know. So, so and the resources are available. So anyway, and I'll, I'll post, I'll show it at the end, but I'll, I'll post my slides at the end on my, on my Twitter account in case um, people wanna look at them and look at the links. So let's start with what do we know about how this disease is transmitted? Um, <clears throat> So first of all, there, there is three ways, and everyone agrees on that. There is three ways you can, in principle, get the disease. The question is always which one is the most important, right? One is through surfaces. We touch someone else's hand or a phone or some light switch that someone else has touched. And then we touch the inside of our eyes, the inside of our nose, or the inside of our mouth. And we can get the disease that way. That seems pretty clear. And then there is two other ways that uh, go through the air. One is these uh, projectiles that uh, mini cannonballs, we call them the droplets or spray borne droplets, is infection through spray. When we talk or when we cough, these projectiles leave us and fly like a cannonball. And then they can, they are, again have to impact inside of the eyes, in this small inside part of the nostrils or inside of the mouth. And they can carry virus and they can infect that way. Or the third way is the, are the aerosols which like the droplets are just little balls of respiratory fluid or saliva that leave us at the same time when we talk, when we cough, but also when we breathe, uh, we always are emitting some aerosols and then these aerosols float in the air like smoke. They are balls like the droplets, but the droplets are much bigger. They behave like projectiles. The aerosols don't have enough inertia to cross the air, they are stopped, but they also they don't have enough weight to fall quickly and they float and then they infect by being inhaled. So primarily they are inhaled and then they can deposit in a respiratory system depending on the size. And that's how we get infected. There is a, what is thought to be a minor way that the aerosols can also deposit on the eyes, but that's thought to be much smaller than the inhalation pathway. So, so I'm gonna talk about you know, what evidence is there to tell which one of these routes is more important. It's a very difficult problem, right? Someone gets infected, exactly how the microscopic virus got to them is, is quite difficult and that's why there is so much debate. But there is one thing that I don't see any debate anymore is that surfaces are not very important. You can get infected that way, we should keep washing our hands. But CDC has been saying for months and all the scientists that you know this is a maybe a 10% of the infection kind of thing. So really the debate is between the projectiles and the smoke, right? the droplets or the aerosols. So what what do the what do different scientific organizations and and health organizations tell us? So this is was published on Science Magazine on the fifth of October. Um, it's an article that I helped write among others, but you know they only allow so many authors. But what this author says, what this uh, letter says, is that there is overwhelming evidence that inhalation, and we use it only aerosols can be inhaled, is a major transmission route and that aerosols are more important than droplets, right? And this is not just something these guys, these scientists thought uh, was good to write. This is the summary of a workshop from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine that you can watch online. There is never an hour of talks and this was the summary, right? So science is telling us that aerosols are more important. Um, what do the, does the medical, um, the medical profession tell us? Let me see here. So this is a letter from the editors of the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases from the Infection this, um, Infectious Disease Society of America, right? And they tell us that short-range aerosol transmission, so transmission to aerosols when you're close, is an important route of transmission, and also longer range when we share the air in a room, and we will come back to that. So they say that this is important as well, right? And they tell us that perhaps the largest surprise th th about aerosol transmission is that it has been surprising to people. And I, I, I would agree with that, but it has been surprising 
too many people in epidemiology and infectious diseases, right? So we see both from more the, the science part of science or the medical part of science, we seem to be reaching, many people are reaching this conclusion. What does the CDC tell us? So the CDC, um, you know, they make it very confusing, but they know it's aerosols because they tell us. They tell us, you know, these particles can be inhaled. So they talk about the droplets and aerosols, but these particles can be inhaled and inhalation is the main way the virus spreads. They do tell us that. Only aerosols can be inhaled, droplets infect by impact. So they're telling us that it is aerosols. Right? But they tell us, they call the aerosols small droplets in other web pages or whatever, because, because they want to favor droplets precautions in hospitals, which really protect against aerosols. So it's all really confusing and, and really, it's really bad that's confusing in my opinion, but it is, it is what they are doing right now. But they know it's aerosols, right? What about WHO? So WHO has evolved and we are gonna look first. At the beginning, there were mixed messages, but the 20th of March, they came with a very clear message that's still on the web page and Twitter and whatever, and that people keep bringing back. And they said, fact is not airborne. This disease is not transmitted through aerosols. It's transmitted through large droplets that are like these projectiles that fall to the ground. Either they hit you or they fall to the ground. Right? That's what they told us. And, and they told us that to say otherwise, to say that it transmits through there is misinformation. Okay? So a message that was extremely clear and stark, this is not an aerosol transmitted disease. As I will tell you later, I think this will go in history the way the imprisonment, imprisonment of Galileo, you know, for, for his innovations about the solar system went. But anyway, but they haven't, the problem is they said this super clearly, this arrived to everyone and they haven't, they haven't said otherwise afterwards, clearly. Okay. So um, this is the latest scientific brief, which is from the 9th of July, which was a few days after our letter with the 239 scientists was published. What do they say there? Well, these large droplets, you know, this can occur, this droplet can happen. The aerosols, well, there is hypotheses and theories and one could inhale, however, we don't know. And later we know more research, you know, anyone reads this and say, you know, droplets, we know for sure. Aerosols, yeah, maybe a few percent, who knows, right? And they haven't really, they don't have another scientific brief after, after this one. They've been making some noise recently. So this is in the last month, uh, there was a talk from Maria Van Kerhove and a video by Maria Neyron, who are high ranking officials there. And they said, ventilation is very important. In both cases, ventilation is very important. And Maria Neyron even recommended a number, six changes per hour, which is similar to what we recommend the scientists, but they don't tell us why. You need ventilation for mysterious reasons, but the virus is not in the air. Now, if you understand the subject is, you know, the surfaces don't care about ventilation. The projectiles don't care about ventilation. Only the aerosols care about ventilation. You tell us ventilation is important. Why don't you tell us aerosols are important? <laughs> but they don't, you know, and, I, and I've talked to actually both of these people and many others and, and they, we haven't convinced them to say it clearly yet. And, and I think it's really important that we say it clearly. That's, that's I think the most important thing to tell the public and to, to get the, the message in place, right? Now there is different countries and whatever who have, have moved beyond. And, and I, I put this one because it's a report that was involved um, in my native country of Spain. It was a report you know, with an epidemiologist from Harvard and a bunch of virologists and only two of us were aerosol scientists. But what we said is that it was substantial support, the aerosol transmission was dominant and that droplet transmission was likely to have been overestimated, right? So I think you know the different, um, uh, health bodies and science bodies are moving in this direction, but frustratingly slowly. Okay. So let's look at the evidence. What uh, what puts us in in this situation? Well, we already know that the surfaces are not major. Um, so what do we know? The most important thing is the disease is easily transmitted in close proximity. A lot of contact tracing, other evidence shows us this. So how do we interpret this? WHO makes the conclusion that because it is transmitted in close proximity, this means it's a droplet disease in which you have these droplets that we said they are projectiles. And this is from a video on the website that you can see. The projectiles leave this person and they impact this person lead, uh, to transmission. And later in the video, they keep more distance and the projectiles uh, describe a perfectly parabolic trajectory and land here. And then they become a surface danger, but, but this person is safe, right? And this is a logical error. <laughs> that they conclude this, this is a possibility, it's a plausible possibility, but it's not proof of droplets, right? This is the whole 
or a lot of people in epidemiology are stuck in this in this error. Because there is an alternative explanation for distance that is the dilution of aerosols, right? And I'm gonna show you um, a movie briefly. This is uh, computational fluid dynamics from some, some Finnish researchers. And this is someone talking and, the, and what the air that, this person, that leaves this person, you see it comes out quickly, but then it's, it's by friction it stops and it gets diluted, it engulfs more air. And as we will see in this continuation of the simulation where we have two people, um, it stops and then it rises because it's warmer in most situations, right? This is common. So then if the person is here, they don't breathe much air because they are far enough. If the person was here, then we will have much more transmission, right? So aerosols can also perfectly well explain uh, why distance helps and it doesn't have to be the droplets, right? Now, so we have to look at more evidence, right? Both explanations are plausible in principle if you don't know anything else. So then, but the one first piece of evidence is like, if we see infection in close proximity and we keep away, and it is these ballistic projectiles, at some point, you know, after two meters, three meters, the projectiles won't reach, and then we won't see any infection, right? But if it is the aerosols, then, you know, you will be more infected in close proximity. There is more smoke, but if it's another aerosol uh, as an analogy. But if you're far away, like in this smoky, low ventilated room, this person, which is far from the smokers, can get infected because the aerosols are gonna fill the room. And we see a ton of super spreading events, as, a, as I will discuss later, where we see this, right? Which tells us that aerosols are certainly important. Droplets, we don't know yet, right? What else do we know about transmission? So we know that there is much more transmission indoor than outdoor. And I'm gonna show some data from contact tracing in Japan in which they followed 22 people who had the disease and they followed the people they had talked to and 88 who had met with people outdoors and 22 who had met with people indoors. And what they saw is of the 22 indoors, 16 had got someone else infected and six did not. Or the 88 outdoors, 77 didn't um, pass the disease to anyone, 11 did. So you see, this is very lopsided. It's really much easier to get the disease talking to someone indoors and outdoors. But then also when you look at how many people are infected, the number of infected reaches much higher numbers, you know, nine, 12 indoors, and you usually see that outdoors, you see two or three, right? So it's really much easier to get infected um, indoors than outdoors. Now, how do we explain this in terms of the droplets and the aerosols? A projectile that has enough inertia to reach someone else and hit them in the eye at a certain distance is not gonna change the behavior dramatically if it's not really windy, you know? So under most conditions, if it was dominated by droplets, you would expect similar infection indoor and outdoor, you know, or similar order of magnitude. But we see factors of 20 or more, and that's more consistent with aerosols. The aerosols get the stop, they rise, there is no ceiling, and, and a much, um, the wind, the velocity of the air, even if you don't feel, it, feel much difference, is about 10, 20 times larger outdoors. So it's much easier that the air is gonna go away. Right? So it's much easier to explain um, this with aerosols and with droplets. Okay, what other evidence we have? Uh, WHO and, and that, that uh, those scientists tell us that, you know, this disease is different than the accepted airborne diseases, which are especially measles, tuberculosis, and chickenpox, right? And it's more similar to things they call droplet diseases like the flu, right? It, it, one person gives it to two and a half, and this is, they say, this is, I mean, many people say, this is evidence that this is a droplet disease, which as, as I will show you, is, I think it's totally wrong, but. Um, but there is another feature of this disease that's very interesting that, you know, each person gives it to two and a half, but that's the average of a very skewed distribution. Some people give it to 10, 20, 50, these super spreading events, you know, 10% of the people give it to 80% of the new infected, and then many people don't give it to anybody, okay? So let's look at that and let's look by starting looking at super spreading events. And I'm gonna briefly describe the, the case of the choir which is a case we investigated with, her, with a group of scientists. And um, basically this appeared in the LA Times. And the moment I saw the article, I wrote to the journalist who put me in touch with the choir. And the choir, I mean, we can't thank them enough. They did everything they could and they answered question after question about exactly what they did. And I think this is probably the best case in the pandemic or one of the best cases in the sense that their activity was highly structured. They were not social, so they hadn't seen each other outside of the outside of the choir. Everyone agrees it's this rehearsal where they got infected. And people got there just in time for the rehearsal. They went to their spots. 
they were more distance. This is not a picture of the choir. They, they were more distance because only half the people show up. They already knew about COVID and they knew about all this early emphasis on surfaces. Nobody touched each other. They had hand sanitizer. The doors were propped open. You know, and they, they sing, sing, sing. Then they have a 10 minute break where they have to go to the bathroom and each person talks to two or three people on average. Then sing, sing, sing. And then they, you know, it's late and they leave. So there isn't a lot of opportunity for the other routes. And you can look at the other routes. Could it be the surfaces? Well, we, we know later that there was someone who was infected and that person didn't touch anything except one bathroom that three other people use. So it's impossible to have infected 52 people through surfaces, right? Could it be the droplets? You know, CDC tells us you need to talk to someone 15 minutes to impact enough droplets. Now, they had one 10 minute break, the index case didn't talk to anyone, other people talk to two or three people. How do you talk to 52 people? <laughs> it's physically impossible, right? And even if there was one other person that was infected that we didn't know about, it's still, it's still basically impossible. On the other hand, it's easy to explain with aerosols. It was a, a room that had low ventilation that was well mixed by the heat of the bodies and the flow from singing. They were not wearing masks, it was a long time. And we know that vocalization leads to emission of a lot of aerosols. And even quantitatively, as I will show you later, it is consistent with other outbreaks, right? This is the worst outbreak because, because it had the worst conditions. Yeah. <clears throat> and importantly, this is one example, and I could spend the whole hour talking about, about other examples, but all the events that have been studied all point to aerosols. There is not a single super spreading event that I am aware of that convincingly shows, no, no, it was the surfaces in this case, or it was the large droplets in this case. So super spreading events are doing a lot of the spreading of the pandemic, and they all point towards aerosols. So what else do we know? So the flip side of the coin is that sometimes the disease is not very contagious, right? Many people don't transmit it to anybody. You know, you have people who share a household with someone infected and the attack rates of sometimes only half of the people or a third of the people who share the household get infected, right? And this is also used as evidence, you know, WHO itself and their committee say, this is evidence that disease is not transmitted through the air. Because if it was transmitted through the air, everyone would get it, right? And, and this kind of evidence. So, so let's look at this in a couple of ways. We're gonna look at documents and papers about two diseases and they both tell us these are droplet diseases that transmit within one meter. Um, and then in one disease, they tell us, you know, a lot of people share the air, but there was no infection. And in the second disease, they tell us the same, you know, there was um, a lot of shared air and there was no infection. But for disease A, we are seeing a lot of outbreaks in these places where we, where we do share the air. And the same happens for disease B, right? So these diseases will say they have very similar patterns of transmission, right? So which diseases are these? Um, so this is tuberculosis until 1950. They told us it was a droplet disease because it transmitted best in close proximity and there were cases in which people shared the air and didn't get infected. And measles until 1985, this is when I was starting the university, they still told us that measles was a droplet disease you know, was not an airborne disease. So this is actually relatively recent, right? And this is measles again. Which disease is this? COVID, right? And this is the WHO documentation on COVID. So they've forgotten their own history. You know, they denied for many years that any disease could be airborne. I, I'll mention it later. And then, but then these diseases were very similar, right? Um, so what, what's going on here with this, this argument that, you know, we sh people share the air so they don't get infected. And if they have a mental model, you know, when WHO or the committee interprets this, it's like anyone who's infected with COVID or with any airborne disease is constantly emitting a lot of viruses, right? So if you ever share the air with someone infected, you must get infected. If you see cases where that's not true, that proves the disease is not, is not ever airborne. And this is, an, again, a logical error, which we pointed to WHO in April and have yet to acknowledge, right? Um, because for several reasons, but the, the diseases are not constant. You don't have this constant emission of pathogens. That's not how, how it works. It's very variable. We have first in time, the relative probability of transmission versus um, the onset of symptoms. As we know, people are very contagious for a short period before the onset of symptoms, a couple of days and just after symptoms start. Some people think this is even shorter, that this is a day or half a day, but there's basically a, a narrow window of time and you have to be in a place with other people sharing the air whatever to get them infected within this period to get transmission, right? And already when you are in the hospital and people are very sick, those people are not very 
are not very contagious. And, and you know, masks that are not outstanding can protect you against people that are not very contagious. But more importantly, this was a study done in China. Um, and they measure uh, how many viruses were coming out of 70 some patients, right? And they found that 27% of the people were exhaling a lot of viruses. It varied between, between 100,000 and 10 million viruses per hour as detected by PCR, right? It's very variable by a factor of 100. But 73% of the people did not exhale viruses that were detectable, right? So the disease is very variable between people. And actually in time, they tell us that they tested some people multiple times, and one time they had a lot of viruses, the next time they didn't, right? So basically the, the key here is that if you see a case in which you share the air and there is no transmission, this is not evidence that the disease never goes through the air. It is evidence that for that person in particular, the disease was not going through the air, right? And this, this logical error is, is really important. Um, <clears throat> and as I was saying, you know, for measles, they spent 75 years telling us that this was and this was a droplet disease because there were these cases in which people shared the air and there was no transmission. Okay, so I'm gonna return to the super spreading events with the model that Adrian has told us and, and um, about. So, and, I, and there is a number of other models from Lydia Morask and many others that, that, but pretty much they all do the same thing. We assume there is a box, which is like a room where we're sharing the air and there's a person that's infected and they emit viruses and then the virus can be ventilated by air comes from outdoors, or it can lose infectivity, or it can deposit to the ground. And that will sustain a, a level of virus in the air, and then this person breathes it in, and then they can get infected, right? And this is it's not complicated, it's just a box model plus what's called the Wells Riley model of infection. Um, and the complicated thing sometimes is to get the parameters for different situations. And it, it's available on the web, anyone can download it and play with it. So we've, uh, we've used it, and I'm gonna plot different outbreaks in this framework. Okay. So here we're gonna have the attack rate and the attack rate is what percent of the people get infected. And on the X axis, we're gonna show a risk parameter. And as you go towards the right, that's higher risk. You have less ventilation, you have longer time, you have no mask or you have worse mask, you have more vocalization that puts more virus in the air or more intense breathing. And you know you have more ventilation whatever you move to the left, right? And this is only about the situation. This, this is nothing about the disease. Then we're gonna, every outbreak is gonna be a point here. Okay? And we're gonna look at different diseases. So, okay. so I start with tuberculosis and, and measles. And here in blue, we have tuberculosis. So my pointer is kind of slow. Um, so uh, we have a typical case here, which is a typical tuberculosis case that you see, you know, you don't get a lot of transmission and, um, it requires really very high risk parameters for to transmit because tuberculosis is not a very transmissible disease. It's airborne, it's accepted to be airborne, and it's only airborne, it can only be transmitted through aerosols. But just the number of, of uh, bacteria that come out of people is very low, right? So how does it survive as a disease? Because someone who's not treated can be infected for a year. Instead of two or three days for COVID, this, you know, so it makes up for a low risk in a given situation by the fact that it has a long time to transmit, right? Measles is the opposite, right? We see here the typical case and a stronger outbreak. And even with very low risk parameters, you can get a high attack rate because it's just a highly transmissible airborne disease as well, right? So, so these two give us, there is a wide range of, of diseases in terms of their airborne transmission capability. So now where does COVID line so every red point here is a covid outbreak okay and this one <clears throat> up here is the choir okay so we see that there is actually is remarkable that they seem to line up and this disease falls in between tuberculosis and measles so they tell us this is different than the who this is different than the airborne diseases it's like it's not different right it lies right in the middle of tb and measles right and, um, and things line up, and actually, if you apply the model, the mathematical model, uh, you would predict that things would follow the red line, right? And the, the different lines would be different aspects of the disease depending on the risk. And, and actually, what this is telling you is at least the, the outbreaks that we are detecting, they all seem to be similar. They seem to be consistent with, uh, uh, with the same parameter. So this is telling us the disease is, is um, is transmitting in a way that's consistent with airborne transmission that is actually even more consistent between situations. Yeah. 
Now you will see these low ones where the numbers are above the line. And I think this may be a bias of which outbreaks we find, because you know in these situations, it's not very likely to have an outbreak, but the outbreak you catch is the one that there was five, seven people infected. Otherwise, you don't realize there was transmission in that environment, right? So I think it's, it's so uh, remarkably consistent and it's consistent with COVID being an airborne disease in between tuberculosis and measles. Okay. okay. So am I doing time-wise? Okay. So what else do we know about transmission? So WHO and others tell us, well, droplets, these droplets that are a projectile, they're much bigger, they have much more volume. So therefore they have much more viruses and this shows that they must be the cause of infection, right? So let's look a little bit about at the physics, um, at the physics of that. So what does WHO tell us? So in the latest scientific brief, and this is still their official position as far as I know, they say that droplets are larger than five to 10 microns, right? And a bacterium is up to three microns. So, so when, a, when a droplet is just slightly larger than individual bacterium, it behaves like a projectile, you know, and travels to the air and can hit someone in the eye. And then aerosols are smaller than five microns, right? This is what they tell us. So, so we can check, you know, um, if they're right. But before we're gonna show the data in this scale. So this is data from Lydia Moraska uh, in this paper. And we have a log scale of volume and a log scale of number, not the number of aerosols, and a log scale of diameter. And the virus is here, but the virus doesn't come naked into the air. It comes into much larger vessels of, of saliva and respiratory fluid, which is more or less this line. And, you know, and um, this to the left of here, you know, these are the aerosols according to WHO. So there are many, there are more actually, but they're smaller. And then we have a lot of droplets, right? And, and they are larger, so maybe they can they can transmit the disease. There may be 50 times more aerosols, but there is still a lot of droplets. Is this correct, right? What they are telling us, well, you don't have to go very far. CDC has an aerosols 101 tutorial. And in that tutorial tell us that, um, um, you know, particles that are 10 microns take eight minutes to settle. Three microns, one and a half hours. Uh, five microns in between take half an hour, right? So they are telling us that, that, that something behaves like a projectile and otherwise it falls in one or two meters in seconds. And this is an enormous error. <laughs> this is just an enormous error. Uh, cloud droplets are 10 or 15 microns. They are not falling you know, from the air so quickly. We wouldn't have clouds if WHO was right. You know, it's just, uh, it's just huge. For, um, for um, a particle to actually fall in seconds and behave like these droplets of the it needs to be 100 microns, which is what the science article was telling us. This is actually known since 1934, but then there was an error that got introduced and, and in, the, in this medical and epidemiological literature, because aerosols were not important and nobody studied them, they've repeated this five micron error for decades, but it's just an error. <clears throat> and Anthony Fauci actually admitted this. So um, Kim Prather and Don Milton from a group of scientists contacted him and explained it to him. And, and he quickly, I mean, to his credit, he said very quickly, oh yeah, they, they told us and yeah, we, we realized that this five micron thing was totally wrong. And he's a smart guy. So he said, you know, the bottom line is that there is much more aerosol than we thought. This is very important. But what's even more important is the flip side of that. There is much more aerosol and there are much fewer droplets. Okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna look at that. So this is the size distribution they told us, but now um, we're in a very different situation. We were here, but now we say, okay, no, aerosols are many more than they had told us before. They go to hundred microns. And actually for a, for a situation like this disease that transmits a lot of transmission is where people don't have symptoms, is not people coughing onto each, uh, each other's face, but is you know situation like talking, then actually there is an, a no man's land in between about 100 microns and 300 microns. Because they, the particles need to be 300 microns to have enough inertia at the speed they come out of people when, when you talk to reach someone and hit them in the eye. Otherwise, between 100 and 300, they are, they are not aerosols, they fall too quickly, but they're not droplets, they don't have inertia to reach someone. And then the droplets, the real droplets when you talk are very few and far between, right? And then these poor droplets that are very few have to hit targets that are very small in, inside of the eyes, inside of the nostrils. While the aerosols, they come out and there's a thousand times more and they float and we have 
we're constantly breathing and we have so many more opportunities to breathe. Them. So the physical situation, the physics, favor aerosols by a huge amount. Yeah. And there is a, a, math a quantitative model done by, by the group of Hugo Lee in Hong Kong, one of the leaders here. And this is telling us how much volume of aerosols or droplets is either inhaled and deposited or impacts the eyes, right? And the black are the aerosols and the red are the droplets, right? And this is the distance, right? And, and it's a log scale with many orders of magnitude. So the first thing we see is that distance helps, you know, social distance helps for aerosols and helps for droplets. You know, so, but when you look at it quantitatively at typical distances in conversation, aerosols are larger than droplets in terms of the dose of volume by a factor of 100 to a factor of 2000. Okay? And there are uncertainties of the model, but not factors of, of a thousand, right? So, so the aerosols, when you are in close proximity, unless you are really, really close, like 20 centimeters to someone, aerosols dominate by a lot. Okay? And this is the dose in volume. Now you have to think about what's the density of pathogen per unit volume. So for every disease that this has been measured before, it hasn't been measured for, for COVID, as far as I know, but tuberculosis, measles, the flu, every disease, it is the aerosols that have more pathogens. We think because of the mechanisms in which these particles get formed, which are kind of like bubbles bursting like in the ocean, and the pathogens get concentrated on the smaller ones. So it's not just the, the volume dose, but there is an additional factor due to the pathogen concentration that favors aerosols even more, right? And there's more details, but, and then, then it's not, it won't be surprising maybe by now, this quote is from, from this paper, they have the link here, is that reviewing the literature on large droplet transmission, there is no direct evidence in the whole history of medicine that any disease is transmitted through droplets. I mean, this is scandalous. We have diseases that are transmitted through aerosols that are well accepted, measles, tuberculosis, whatever, whatever, that encompass COVID. There is no disease ever that has been firmly demonstrated to be transmitted through droplets. COVID appears, immediately they tell us this is a droplet disease and the droplets fall to the ground and whatever, and, and all the precautions are based on that. I mean, this is just a scandalous in my opinion. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. Okay, so there, there is more resources here that you can see uh, the NSF workshop or a talk by Don Milton that you, you can see the slides later when I put them on Twitter. And I'm going to uh, skip this quickly, but I'll, I'll say one thing about aerosol generating procedures, which is the one thing WHO told us from the very beginning. Aerosol generating procedures is the one time aerosols are dangerous, right? Like intubation, right? So there is a group of uh, Jeff Reed in Bristol who has done some measurements of this. And these are kind of the, the particle counts, so the, the aerosol counts as a function of time as they do different things. So one is just someone is a voluntary is, is coughing, you know, and they see that when people cough, yeah, we can see these detectable aerosols in a very clean room, right? Um, as, as we expect and has been measured before. But when they do intubation, which is the black line, you can barely see any aerosols. And when you see extubation of the volunteer, you don't see any aerosols until they finish. And then after the extubation is done, the volunteer was coughing. And then some aerosols appear, right? So even this definition of aerosol generating procedures, at least uh, from this study, seems to be incorrect. The real aerosol generating procedures are coughing, sneezing, talking, and breathing. And you know, of these ones in the hospital, I mean, this needs more studies. Certainly, we should we should uh, keep wearing masks as we do these things. But it's not, you know, this research maybe had not been done rigorously, had not been done uh, by by doing these actual measurements. You know, now it's good that top people in the aerosol community are are getting involved in doing these measurements and clarifying uh, the situation. When you look at all the evidence, and this is a table uh, that we're compiling, and you see, you know. For different pieces of evidence, including some that I have told you, what's consistent with droplet surfaces of aerosols, you know, everything is consistent with this is an aerosol transmitted disease. There is some evidence that could be indicative of surfaces, but these large droplets really have very little evidence. And they have some, in red, we have some evidence that, that really goes against it. I mean, so, so I think my take is, you know, aerosols are 75%, 80%, you know, some 90%, I don't know surfaces maybe 10% and droplets really are only important when someone coughs or sneezes in your face and it hits you. You know, then they, then I believe it can transmit the disease. But if they cough away from you, the droplets are lost, but the aerosols stay floating. Okay? 
So it's really, in my opinion, completely the opposite that we have been told uh, for all these months. You know, so how do we how did we get here? You know, like I'm telling you, this WHO and these large bodies that have access to every scientist in the world got it completely wrong, uh, and it's because it's very strongly rooted in history. Um, you know, uh, Pasteur discovered germs in 1860, and in 1910, Charles Chapin, uh, American public health researcher, reviews all the evidence and writes a, a seminal book called "The Sources and Modes of Infection," okay? and sees how how do different diseases transmit. And he has a huge advance, which is what we call contact infection. You know, people thought maybe the germs live in in dirty water, in putrid water, in trash, and then that's where they come to people, through the air, through the family. And then he's like, no, 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 you you get uh, you get a germ because it was the germ was alive inside of someone else, and they give it to you. You know, through this contact between people, this appears obvious now. Of course, you get the flu from someone, right? But that was his advance. And this, his book becomes the, the textbook, right? And up to here, it's all fine. But the problem is that, and he says it here, this is the last page of the chapter in urban infection. He says, you know, it's impossible to teach people to avoid contact infection if they're firmly convinced that air is the chief vehicle of infection, right? And, and the infection through the air, the problem is it wasn't thought very logically. It could come through the air on the street or it could cross the Atlantic and infect someone in in the UK and crazy things like that. So he says, you know, I need really this miasma idea. I need to go against that. And then he says, you know, there is no evidence. We don't have evidence whether it goes to the air or not. But I'm going to say that it doesn't, you know, because we don't need it. We can explain uh, the transmission with droplets, with these large droplets that fall to the ground, of which there was a little evidence. And, uh, and I'm going to say it doesn't go through the air. And if someone wants to show it, they need to provide extraordinary evidence, right? Because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This and Chapin became the president of the American Public Health Association, was really successful. You know. uh, there's a talk that he gave at Harvard in 1917 that's, that's uh, very interesting to read. And, and the book is available online and I highly recommend it. Um, but uh, this became a paradigm and then a dogma, which is, you know, when we talked to WHO in April 6th, it's like they had, a, you know, Chapin was back to life and we were talking to him. They were all Chapinistas, you know. They were all, you know, infections through the air is almost impossible, you know. So what are you telling us, you know? Even though we had as much evidence and now we have much more evidence of airborne this transmission, to them is it's such an outlandish idea that is very difficult to accept, right? Even though already in, in the 1930s, William Wells at Harvard and Edward Riley started to show, no, no, this is, this is incorrect. This is just can go through the air, but they spent decades, as I said, trying to demonstrate that measles and chickenpox and tuberculosis that were considered droplet diseases, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, were actually airborne diseases. But it took um, a long time, and they, they managed to demonstrate it, but again, it took decades, right? But during the, the 20th century, there was a great progress against infectious diseases with, with all the vaccines, antibiotics, and whatever, and we eradicated the smallpox and all that. So this issue of transmission has never been a top issue in the public or the scientific consciousness until now. It's been this pandemic where we've been for a year without a vaccine and without a, a cure, that really we had to worry about transmission. And you know, people like myself and a lot of other people got involved and the press has gotten interested. And, and we are finally overturning this dogma, right? And one thing that's curious as a result of this history, you now these people tell us, uh, like WHO, is like, if it was an airborne disease, it would be highly transmissible like measles, right? They forget about tuberculosis, which is not highly transmissible, but chickenpox and measles are very transmissible. But then they are confusing an artifact of history that only diseases that were very transmissible, either at one time like measles or over a long time like tuberculosis, only those have been demonstrated. So they're confusing that with a law of nature. They think it's a law of nature that all diseases <laughs> makes no sense whatsoever, right? As long as the disease can survive at a disease, that's the only law of nature that uh, airborne transmission needs to fulfill, right? And COVID-19, I think we're in agreement, has no trouble surviving as a disease, right? <laughs> we, we wish. Anyway, um, okay, so I'll, I'll finish quickly. So anyway, so, but aerosols, you know, since 1910 till 2020, aerosols have not been important, have been considered outlandish, you know, really, really rare transmission, right? So they have not been studied in the medical profession and epidemiology, right? And, and they keep making these errors of the five microns, which is, if you know this much about aerosol physics, 
you, you don't keep repeating that five micron error, but it's 30 years of repeating it in paper after paper and WHO documents and uh, citing each other. We're actually writing a paper with historians tracing where the error was introduced and um, which is inter it's a story for another day. But, uh, but then this has led to the fact, you know, COVID-19 appears and they form a committee to decide how to protect themselves against the infection. There is not a single aerosol expert, none. And this is someone who worked with WHO on masks, which are aerosol filters. And he said, never in any meeting with WHO or even a single email, there was an aerosol science. You know, so the problem at WHO, I mean, some people talk about conspiracies in China. And it's a problem of narrow, narrowness. You know, they have, you know, the, this seems outlandish to them. They don't have any expert that understands it. And, and you know, they really, they just need to ventilate the room and let, let other expertise, in, you know, and they are all hand washing experts in the committee or a lot of them. And then of course they told us we had to do a lot of hand washing. Um, yeah. So I'll go quickly. I'll, uh, and we face a lot of resistance. This is a quote from someone uh, in the WHO committee that said, you know, these people are chemists, engineers, owners of ventilation companies. So saying, you know, we're, we're saying it's aerosols because we have an economic interest and we don't know, we're ignorant. You know, what are we, what are we, you know? And, and what we say, you know, it's like, you know, we, we would like to go do other things. But um, as this doctor said, who I would recommend following on Twitter, he said, I'm getting a PhD in COVID. And the required courses are epidemiology, virology, immunology, clinical medicine, but aerosol science. And I think this is the right order. Not for a moment, I think aerosol science is the most important discipline. This discipline in a, in a pandemic, epidemiology is the most important discipline. But in aerosol science, there was a huge error and they need to listen to us, you know, and, and it's, the epidemiologists don't know about this, this uh, motion through the air as they have shown by quoting the five micron error. No. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the science. And I'm gonna say, you know, some things very briefly about how, okay, it goes through the air, what can we do? It shouldn't be scary. We can do lots of things that are very effective and that many of which are free, okay? So it shouldn't be a, a really scary thing and that we would really empower the, the, the public if we told them, okay? um, With other scientists, we have put together this FAQ, so it's tinyurl.com slash FAQ dash aerosols, okay? Everything I'm gonna tell you and basically everything I've ever been asked is here. There is pages and pages and links and figures. Um, so I'm just gonna say um, <clears throat> a couple of things. One is we have to think that is like smoke. The most useful thing is you tell people, okay, everyone you cross is like exhaling this smoke, which is floating in the air. And whatever you would do in this situation or that situation to breathe as little smoke as possible, that's what you have to do. You can get infected if you talk to someone close without a mask, because then there is a lot of smoke between the two of you and you will inhale a lot. In other words, if you can smell, smell the garlic breath on someone, then you are breathing the air that's coming out of them with very little dilution. That's a very risky situation. Now you keep your distance, but you share the air in a room, but you share the air, you are breathing the same air for a long time. That's also risky. And those are all the super spreading events. It takes a little more effort to get infected that way than in close proximity because there is a lot more dilution of the aerosols, right? And you know, so so when and when we say it's like a smoke, it's not like you go on the street and you smell the smoke for a second and oh, I'm gonna get infected, right? No, no, no. You need to talk to someone for 15 minutes or or you need to share the air. In the super spreading events, it's often an hour or two hours, or you know, that people share the air in the same low ventilated room and then you get a lot of infection. Yeah. So and I'm gonna just say a couple of things about ventilation. So airborne diseases, we know that ventilation works very well. And this is a study for tuberculosis uh, was published this year in which they started to detect some cases. We know tuberculosis is a slow disease, right? But in this dorm, they started to see cases. They started to see cases in Taiwan, I believe. And then they realized that the ventilation was very low, this 1.7 number and the CO2, the exhaled air was very high was 3,000 parts per million, which is a very high number. Now they realized this and they sent the engineers into the dorm and they started ventilating more than 10 times more. And the CO2 went from 3,000 to 600 and outdoors is 400. So there was very little recirculation of exhaled air in that room. And the outbreak went away. You know, there were some cases that appeared that were probably still transmission that happened in this period, but they stopped the outbreak with ventilation. And this has been shown with multiple um, airborne diseases multiple times. Right? So ventilation helps right, for a disease that's airborne like COVID-19. 
Now, the problem with ventilation, if we, if we tell people in the winter, you know, in Canada or in, in Minnesota, you have to open the windows. And they're like, yeah, but it's really cold. And my pipes are going to freeze. So there is a trick that uh, I wasn't aware of, but we have uh, discovered recently, which is this one of using CO2, right? Because we exhale CO2 and the infected person exhales the virus. And this exhalation, accumulation, ventilation are the same processes for both. Okay? Then there are some processes that are not the same, but, but it's close enough and is the, is the only thing we can measure that is really useful, right? So you can get these, these meters like, uh, like here, you know, that use uh, non-dispersive infrared technology and DIR and cost about 90, Euro, 90 dollars, something like that. Those are the ones that, that work. The cheaper ones don't work so well. And, um, and you know, this is when I put it outside. So there's about 400 parts per million. And then this is when we were in the car and we were there for, um, for half an hour with everything closed, resigulated there. 4,000 parts per million. This means 10% of the air we were breathing for the second time. Okay, so this is really dangerous if we were sharing the air with other people. And you see these levels in um, in schools and in places where people share the air, and you routinely see thousands. Yeah? So uh, and then, but then we we switched the car to just uh, take air from outside, and then it went down to a much more tolerable level, right? Where only one percent of the air was circulated. <clears throat> So one thing that I think should transcend the pandemic, because there are other infectious diseases and other air quality reasons, that every public place where we share the air should have a CO2 meter with the traffic light that we can see. And this can be done for relatively low cost. If it wasn't ma massively, this would be less than $100 a pop. Right? And then you could see if there is a supermarket with 700 and a supermarket with 3,000, go to the one that has 700. You know? uh, <clears throat> And this is someone's trip on an aircraft. Anyway, I'll I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just leave it here, basically. Uh, and just this is the link for the estimator, the link for the FAQs, uh, my Twitter account where I'll put the slides. And I'd like to thank all the scientists I've been working with, but not by a long shot. I figure everything I said myself. I'm I'm uh, you know presenting work of 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 many people. And thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, thanks, Jose, for this uh, fantastic uh, webinar. Very insightful indeed. Um, many useful tips that hopefully will keep people healthy. Uh, there's a long list of questions that we received over the, the past hour. Uh, let me start at the top. Um, do you recommend people to wear masks and goggles even outside, especially when others are not wearing masks? Uh, um. <clears throat> Goes on and says, if you can smell smoke from a far distance, how safe is it when lining up outside? Yeah, I mean, I would say the, I mean, there, is, there is an index of risk. What makes a situation risky? A long time indoors with low ventilation, talking and without masks, right? So if you are in that situation, there are people without masks, I would say just, just go away if you can, you know. But otherwise, certainly wear masks. About wearing goggles, as we, as we said, the, the thought is that the infection through the eyes is less likely. But but uh, I have some goggles which I wear when I go to a supermarket or something. But uh, people look at me like I'm a Martian, but that's another. I mean, like some of these chemistry safety goggles that cost eight dollars in McMaster car. You know, don't, you don't need to get anything fancy, right? That something that blocks the air from exchanging quickly, and um, you know. But outdoors, you know, I think outdoors if you keep your distance. You know, I still wear a surgical mask just because, you know, a runner crosses you and should not to be paranoid. But I would say outdoors with distance is not so necessary. I would say it's indoors and especially the goggles, I would say it's for people like people in a hospital or people in a, who work in a supermarket, who work in a situation where they're in contact with a lot of people, sharing a lot of air, especially if you don't know what the ventilation is. And I would say that I would do it there. For the general population, I think the more important thing is to fit your mask well. Because there are some measurements from the Max Planck that show that if you have a gap, so the, the, the mask has a certain surface area, right? So you have a gap that's 2% of the surface area, a tiny gap, like here on the nose, if you didn't uh, tighten the, the metal piece, or you have a gap on the side of a surgical mask, 50% of the air goes through there, right? Because the air has a much easier time going through the hole than traversing this filter, right? So really think where there is a huge leverage is telling people to fit their masks well, and, and for men not not to have um, beard because because the mask has a hard time uh, you know and then the air comes to the to the um, 
to the herd. You know, so I think those are um, one important things with respect to the outdoor question and the smoke. As I said, you know, if you have a smoke and you smell a little smoke, it's, I mean, smoke is a good analogy of how it spreads and how it fills a room and whatever. The smoke is too strong compared with, with transmission of COVID, right? So sometimes you can smell the smoke from far away. We think it's extremely unlikely you will get you will get sick for something like that. You know, people that would be maybe more like measles or even more. It's, you you need to talk to someone for a while. So you imagine how much smoke you would breathe if you were talking to someone at half a meter for 15 minutes. That's the kind of the amount of smoke we're talking about. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. Now to follow up on that, I mean this analysis, sort of like you can talk for 15 minutes. Um, if you look at the Wells Riley model. I mean, it's based on the linear or the, what they call the exponential model, but that the chance increases linearly with exposure. So yes, the, the chance would be very low for being at a distance, but it never goes to absolutely zero, right? It's, it's hard to teach people math in a quantitative fashion. Um, so I don't know whether you have any more comments on that. It's so like, you can never reduce risk to zero. I mean, I, I think the I think the, the, the Wells Riley model. Very few people used it because very few people. Uh, I mean, what happened to my colleagues is that they submitted a proposal to study airborne transmission, and the reviews will come back and they say airborne transmission is not important. We shouldn't waste money on this proposal. So there was a very small community studying this, right? And you know, so I'm sure we will see advances in the structure and whatever of the Wells Riley model. But it seems to work for for from looking at all these outbreaks. Now, when the probability is very, very low, I mean, that's more, I would say, sociology. When the, I mean, I've seen this many times with this pandemic. There's a third of the people that you tell them something and they panic. Then there's a third of the people who don't care and they don't take any measures. And then there's the third of the people in between who are, okay, they can take logical measures. So some people are going to panic and we have to try to calm them down. At the same time, they try to convince the other third that, no, no, you should take this seriously. Mm. All right. Uh, next question is, is a, little, a little bit of a, a sociological, psychological question. You've already gone into that during your talk a little bit, but why do you think the WHO is denying the evidence? Are they trying to avoid scaring people too much? I mean, I, I sort of agree with the idea that the community seem to be very reluctant to sort of say it's airborne because it would scare people the wits out of people and uh, create a panic or what, what's your thinking about it? Is it really ignorance or is it? Um, I, I think, I mean, I, I've talked to them a, a lot and I've talked and we had meetings with the committee and we talked to the people. So, I mean, to me it's three quarters is they really don't believe it because they come from this tradition where everyone transmission is really unlikely, you know, and, and to them, this behaves like what they have called for decades them and their advisors and the advisors, you know, going back to 1910, is having droplet diseases. So really, it's really difficult. And and they don't think about aerosols and droplets physically. They think if you infect in close proximity, that's evidence of droplet. And it's hard to get them out of that. You know, so I, I think it's really, that's a big part. Then, so then they start by, it's hard to convince them that's important. And then they say, yeah, it may be a little bit, but then if we say serbon, Will scare people, will scare healthcare workers, there'll be a scarcity of masks and that kind of thing. I think that that also plays a role. And maybe that the fraction due to that is increasing because now they are, they are smart people and they're saying it's very important to have ventilation. So I think they're realizing that it, airborne transmission is not so negligible, right? But um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um Another interesting question here. How would you rank the relative risk of aerosolized fomite transmission, not just fomites, when compared to say um, droplet or, or aerosol transmission? I mean, the, the person is referring to that um, uh, study in Wuhan showed up in nature where people, healthcare workers that take off their protective gear in the changing room apparently created aerosol. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and there is a recent study for the flu that showed that they painted the virus on these ferrets, I think, and then other people, other ferrets got infected. So this is surfaces that re aerosolize the, the virus. Um, this is, seems plausible, but I think that there is two things. It's, I think it's much more unlikely, right? Because if you think about an aerosol, it comes out and it's floating. So during this time when it is floating, um, <clears throat> it's much easier that you breathe it. If it falls to the ground, someone has to walk on it and then re-aerosolize it. 
is use the quantitatively, I think the virus that falls to the ground has a much lower chance. So I think it's, it's not dominant, it may play a role. But the other thing is that we defend against that exactly as we defend against the regular aerosol. So it may augment the regular aerosols a little bit, but if you have someone infected, we have to do the same thing, right? And we also know th this virus doesn't survive, doesn't stay infected for huge amounts of time, you know? So um, I, I don't think, I don't think it's very important. I mean, some people were saying it's, it's not a bad idea to clean the floors where a lot of people walk. That that seems like a good idea, but but I would say we should first do things like ventilation, masks, and and that kind of thing. I think that's likely to have a much larger impact. Right. Uh, one more question here is um, where does the five or six air changes per hour recommendation come from? Um, is it sort of like a, an arbitrary number or who came up with it or what, 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 what's the background? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know all the background, but, but uh, a lot of these recommendations, I mean, and we talk to the public health people where they say one meter, and in some countries it's one and a half, two meters, whatever. It's a combination of something that provides quite a bit of protection without being perfect and that it is feasible, right? So that's why in countries which people are closer together in Europe, they may say a meter and a half, and here in the US we say six feet, right? Because we have more room, right, in, in most places. Um, so I think the fiber changes per hour, um, one of the groups was the Harvard School of Public Health, and it's a good number. I mean, I mean you're, you're exchanging the air every 12 minutes, so you are not giving the virus a chance to build up. Of course, more changes per hour would be better, but but in the winter, it can be very hard to do. And in many places, it's even hard to do five, right? I don't know exactly how WHO got to six, but it's a similar number. And a similar number is, is the when we say, I mean, I say 700 parts per million of CO2 or below, other experts say 800. And it's kind of the same thing. You know, it's like you have to come with something that is, I mean, because you are comparing with, you, you see otherwise indoors 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, right? So what you want to get is if you get people from 5,000 to 700 or 800 or 600, you know, you've done the bulk of the work. Then if you could, if you could do it a little better, right? But now we're in the phase of entering people's consciousness. And if you, we can get people to 700, then we would limit things a lot. So I think it's, yeah, I, I think it's some, some version of this. So sort of related to this, I mean, airplanes, uh, commercial jetliners are supposed to have a very high number of air turnovers. I think it's in the 16 to 20 range or thereabouts. Do you know what the CO2 levels are in an air, airline uh, cabin? Uh, yes, one second. Uh, in fact, I have, a, um, I have a slide I can show uh, in a moment from a colleague in Europe who um, flew in one of these um, airplanes. So this is a several hour trip. The whole slide is about four hours. So the person is in the airport and this is the CO2 measured by one of these monitors. They're in the bus, they're in the terminal and this is pretty well ventilated. Then they get into the airplane. And then during the boarding, the concentration of CO2 gets pretty high. So it is a riskier situation. Then here they close the door and they turn on the, the real ventilation system. And during the flight, it was about 700 parts per million. Now they be plane and this person must have been in the first row, got out very quickly. And then here they are outdoors and they go into a train. So you see things are pretty well ventilated. And here you have filtration in addition to ventilation. So we say the plane ride itself is pretty safe. But there is this period before the, the boarding, the, the, the boarding period in the boarding panel and in the plane that is, is much more dangerous because they didn't turn on the ventilation. And actually Boeing and Airbus has said that you should turn the ventilation in the planes immediately during boarding, but this airline didn't do it, right? And so kind of, if you are a passenger, I would go to the gate agent and say, make sure you follow the Boeing recommendations <laughs> and turn on the ventilation. But it is not the most unsafe place, the airplane itself during the flight, but, but it can be depending on the airport and whatever, the, the jetway. I mean, you are sharing the air with many people uh, during the trip, right? Um, another question here, or more common, the key issue would be how long does the uh, pathogen survive in aerosol surfaces, etc. That would be the critical piece of information if we struggle 
through these conflicting models of droplets and aerosols. Um, you want to comment on? Yeah. Um, I mean, but there are many measurements now, and they all the, the virus retains infectivity an hour or two hours, right? It depends exactly. It depends on temperature and humidity. You know, cold cold helps it uh, retain infectivity. If it warms, it destroys it faster. But but you need big big temperature changes. So if you are at uh, 10 degrees C, like 50 F, in a in a slaughterhouse, in a meat packing plant, this really favors the survival. But if you change it by 2F at home, that's a very small effect. And then in humidity, you see something funny that the virus retains effectivity very well at low humidity if it's very dry, or at high humidity if it's very humid. And in between and in the middle humidities, it actually loses infectivity faster. So maybe in 45 minutes instead of two hours or something. And some people propose to humidify indoors um, to fight this, which is useful, but you know we think we should first ventilate and filter and, and then work on the humidity, right? So, but but it survives long enough. I mean, for the first question is that the virus comes out and it does. If it lost the infectivity in seconds or in minutes, then you would say, okay, it, this airborne transmission is not, is not feasible. But but an hour is or two hours is more or less how long the air is going to be in a room anyway, right? So so it's totally plausible from that point of view. All right. A sort of a related uh, question is: What is the effect of indoor humidity uh, on aerosol propagation? Um, I guess there are many different aspects. How long does it stay airborne? You already sort of referred to the fact of the lifetime of the uh, viability of the the virus is impacted. But what about how long it stays airborne? Oh, oh. how long is it airborne in? Um... So it depends. That depends on the size, right? Because basically, something that's 100 microns will settle in seconds. Something that's uh, 10 microns will settle in 10 minutes. You know, so that's not really clear where the pathogen is. What what we think, based on the evidence, is that it is between one and 10 microns that a lot of the virus is uh, that size of of particle, which is is mostly so it's a huge ball of saliva and respiratory fluid and mucin and sodium chloride and a little bit sprinkle of virus, right? It's not a naked virus floating around. And um, so then you are thinking, you know, maybe an hour will be a typical time. I mean, it may be longer, maybe a few hours, but but if it stays a few hours without settling, it's gonna be ventilated before, or it's gonna lose infectivity, right? So at the end is like an hour, I would say, what's dangerous is to share the air at the same time, right? It's not a virus that's so infective that if someone was was in a room and you come in two hours later, are you going to still get infected? People see that for measles, and that was part of how finally it got accepted. For this disease, I mean, it's not impossible, but if someone came to clean the choir room after the choir, I'm sure they would have gotten infected. But I think it needs to be much more exceptional situation, right? And 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 it's really sharing the air for a long time, or you know, that 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 is gonna that's gonna do it. All right. Um, another question here is, is the distinction by size between droplets and aerosols artificial? I mean, you've already gone into that in your seminar quite extensively, but I mean, there's still communities that talk about droplets. I mean, it's a little bit of a semantic issue, I guess. I mean, when do you call it a droplet or when do you call it an aerosol? Because it's a continuum. Once it dehydrates, it becomes lighter. And after a while, it's light enough not to fall anymore at the significant um, rate. I, I think that that's uh, that what you just said is misinformation, and uh, yeah. it, it's very wide, widespread misinformation. But I think it's the droplet to aerosol distinction is always through history since Chapin and Wells. Droplets has, have always been the spray borne droplets, infection by spray, infection by impact, right? Aerosols have always been infections through inhalation. You look at the physics; there is a clear break, right? Below 100, they can be inhaled and they don't fall very quickly. When you talk above 300, they fall very quickly and they have enough inertia to hit someone and there is a break. So it's a very useful distinction, right? What, what is happening, which is what I said about the CDC, there are people who don't wanna call the disease airborne. They don't wanna say it's aerosols. So they are, they are accepting it's aerosols, but they are calling the aerosols droplets. They are, they are now extending, droplets are extending. No, no, droplets are all the way to five microns, you know, using the error that they used to have, they say, no, no, but between five microns and 100 microns are inhalable droplets. 
that's a new concept that's whitewashing the error. So I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's, it's a really useful distinction and we should keep it because it, because because the how you protect yourself against projectiles or how you protect yourself against inhalable things are very clearly distinct things and we don't want to mix mix these things i'm sorry all right all right i'm fine with that um <laughs> another question here um i'm a bit surprised that your estimate of fomite transmission is as high as 10 percent oh <laughs> um because in that case, we're back at uh, disinfecting our mail and our groceries because 10% is not a negligible number. You want to sort of. Um, make, I'm, make a, I, I'm not an expert on fomite, so you should take uh, you should take uh, that estimate with a large droplet of salt. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I talk to experts, and then I, I do see that debate. Some people think it's 10, 15%. Some people think it's zero. But I, I don't know enough and I don't see, you know, the, I don't see that we know for sure it's here, right? So I mean, I don't think, I don't disinfect my mail anymore. And I, what the experts that know more tell us is that you should keep washing your hands frequently and not, don't, not touch your eyes, your nose and your mouth. And that's what they do, the people who study the, that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, could it, could it be less than 10% is possible? I just haven't studied that to, in detail, and I do see the scientists debating in that range. But but nobody says anymore that surfaces are fifty percent. I haven't seen that in in six months. Right. It it seems to be pretty safe to say it's an upper limit. I think that ten percent. Mm -hmm. um, there's mm -hmm. actually a, a classic uh, experiment back from nineteen eighty seven, um, not on COVID, of course, but on the rhinovirus, which has many similarities. And they did mm -hmm. this beautiful experiment where in a college dorm, they separated the two groups with plexiglass window and they were playing cards. So at the end of the night, the playing cards were saliva soaked from sorting them and there was no transmission after a night of playing when those saliva soaked cards were passed from one side of uh, the window partition to the other. Whereas when the partition wasn't there, it was like 70% of the people caught the virus. So it sort of highlights the absence of, of FOMI transmission, at least for that particular case of the, the rhinovirus. Mm -hmm. I think there's, it's always hard to prove the absence of evidence, but so mm -hmm. 10% upper limit, I, I'd mm -hmm. be good with that too. Um, next question here, um, is the common cold switch, um, sorry, is the common cold uh, it's much lower than uh, R zero, also transmitted through aerosols. Well, so, as, as Adrian just explained, rhinovirus, which is one of the calls, is transmitted through aerosols. And for other other calls, two other calls are other coronaviruses that have similar R zero. So chances are they also transmitted through aerosols. I mean, the call has a bunch of viruses. I mean, I think I, I skipped through that, but I think since 1910, it has been assumed that respiratory diseases is almost impossible to transmit through the air unless you spend decades demonstrating it beyond any doubt, like a criminal trial, like beyond any reasonable doubt, right? I think we need to flip that to change the paradigm and to think every respiratory disease, it is likely that it's transmitted through aerosols. Why? Because we produce aerosols all the time when we breathe, when we talk, whatever. And that is the lining of our lungs, the lining of our pharynx, the lining of our, our nose, whatever, whatever. And if you have a respiratory disease, that's where the pathogen is, right? And then those are going to float in the air and it's likely. So I think we should, we should flip the thing and assume they are all transmitted through aerosols unless there is a demonstration that, that it doesn't happen. I think that's, that's, that's what we need to completely change the paradigm going forward. All right. Uh, one more interesting question, sort of like uh, close to your uh, area. Uh, you were very brief on experimental measurements of aerosols. Um, such measurements could settle the question most convincingly, uh, the, the person asks here. Uh, are they hard to perform or why? what's the problem with doing quantitative measurements of, of um, those aerosols? Well, the, I mean, the quantitative measures of, of how many aerosols come out, there are many through the years. Um, what has been difficult, and this was something that WHO, when we met with them in April, they said this was a condition sine qua non, 
is that we showed um, infective aerosol, infective virus in aerosol. Now, this has been shown now by the, the group of Lednicki, but this is something that's exceedingly difficult in the, in the sense that you can have very few viruses in aerosols, very diluted in a lot of air that are capable of infection, but they are still hard to detect, right? Because you can have used very few aerosols and through history, you know, so tuberculosis and measles are accepted as airborne diseases. Never, no one has ever taken measles from the air and shown that it is infective in cells. That has not been done. Neither for tuberculosis. Never has someone taken taken air and shown that that those aerosols can can infect. Right? That has not been done. Right? But for COVID, they told us it has to be done or this is totally implausible. And it has been done, but there is an impressive technological advance because the one problem is this virus. These viruses are delicate, and to capture these aerosols from the air, you have to take a lot of air and take these aerosols and impact them on a surface, right? And this is a very violent process that shears the outside of the aeros of the virus and leads to the activation, right? And this has been has been measured. So there was this technology called Vivas in which basically they make a cloud with the aerosols. So they have the aerosol and they grow a lot of water, and then they can capture it in water very uh, very gently. Right, and this is a study in Florida. So, but it has required this technological advance, right? And then, when finally we had this demonstration that the WHO wanted, I said, "Well, but that wasn't that study wasn't perfectly done, and and uh, you know, now they want more, and, and maybe because it was there and it was effective, doesn't it mean it's it is doing the transmission anyway." They said, uh, "There is a moving of the goalposts that's really frustrating, but but it is really really difficult. Just as a question of is, is something very finely dispersed." Very few, I mean, respiratory aerosols in a room are 0.1% of the aerosols that are present, right? And they don't need to have a lot of virus. I mean, it's the, 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 the measurement, as Adrian, I see Adrian nodding, this measuring the virus in the aerosol is very difficult. Okay. Uh, another uh, technical question is, uh, are smoke particles comparable in size to aerosols? Is smoke really a good analogy? Um, um, I mean, in, in the time, I mean, so it's a good analogy in the, um, in the time scale, you know, I mean, it's a good analogy when you see it coming out of someone, the situation you are talking to someone and you imagine you are talking to a smoker and how this stands out. And it's a good analogy in a room in how the, the air spreads in a room. You know, you, you someone lights a cigarette in a, in a room, you know, at the beginning you see the smoke, but you don't smell it. But in five, 10 minutes, you're going to smell it the smoke, right? We all have that experience and it depends on the room, exactly how the air is flowing. So it's a very good analogy for that, right? Then smoke is smaller. Smoke is about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 microns. So it stays in the air a lot longer, right? But at the end, um, while these respiratory aerosols, we think there are a few microns, so they may be stay in the air an hour or two hours, but an hour or two hours versus 20 hours doesn't matter for the for the room. An hour is long enough, right? If it, stay much, if it stays in the air much longer than an hour, it's just going to be exhausted with ventilation. So, so we think it's a good enough analogy for, for that. It's not a perfect analogy. And there is one another imperfection that with the smoke, you also have the smell. And the smell is done by gases, not by the aerosol. So people are sometimes, masks don't work because I can smell the smoke through the, through the mask. And that makes no sense, right? The mask is filtering most of the aerosols, but a lot of the gases just can make it through. Can I just right. maybe follow up? Uh, sorry, Adrian, but just, you know, very related. There were some questions, you know, for example, riding an elevator after somebody, even if you're alone, uh, being in a, in a swimming pool when you have also chlorine around, how does that affect the, the aerosol, um, you know, landscape, so to speak? So the, both of those are in the frequently asked questions if people want more details, but just briefly, for a, well, for a modern elevator in the US that's well ventilated, there is like maybe 15 or 18 or it changes per hour, you know? So you don't wanna, you know, if, if you are there in the elevator, maybe let it air a little bit or, uh, you know, hold your breath if you don't have many places to go, wear your mask, don't talk in the elevator, but it's not the most dangerous situation. It's also a very brief time, right? It's a very short time. Um, a swimming pool, that's a good question. We, we don't know, and I don't know, I've talked to colleagues, but I don't think, because there is chlorine compounds that are oxidizing, like hypochlorous acid, and those could deactivate the virus, much like ozone does by reacting with double bonds in the biomolecules. But we don't know 
I don't know if anyone who has studied whether that's enough. And there are people who, so I would say, but, but swimming pools tend to be well ventilated. So I would say, you know, bring, bring your CO2 meter and see if it's well ventilated and there are not a lot of people, it's probably not very unsafe. And you may have that extra protection from the chlorine, but it's, it's not clear yet. Right. Maybe uh, one more interesting question here about a very controversial uh, topic. Uh, what do you think about the lack of effectiveness of face shields compared to face masks as observed in an outbreak in Switzerland? There seems to be another line of evidence for the importance of aerosol transmission, but it's more in general the question of face shields, how much protection both for egress and ingress. Uh, would, would you dare to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, and this has been, there is a really good study from NIOSH in 2014 where they, they showed this already. Face shields are very good, you know, in a hospital, if someone is coughing, they are a very good barrier for this, the droplets that they do exist when someone coughs, they, they stop them, right? So in a hospital, in that situation, they are a good thing. But, you know, aerosols like smoke, you know, you have a face shield, you think you're gonna breathe the smoke, it's absurd, right? It will go around and uh, so they are not, um, they are not very useful in that situation. So I would say, if, if you are concerned about the eyes, then goggles protect you against both. Why not wear goggles instead of a face shield, right? If you're gonna wear a face shield, that would be what I would say. I mean. All right, um, one question here. In a not very well ventilated room with people wearing masks, are aerosols still important? Um, yes. <laughs> Um, and I know who uh, some people may have seen this simulation from from El Pais about uh, the bar and the family meeting and whatever. It depends on the situation, but a mask um, may reduce transmission a factor of two, a factor of three. It depends which masks and how well they are worn, right? What I see in society is there is a variety of masks and there is a variety of of how well they are worn, which leads to having gaps here and having gaps there. So in the model, we assume you know the mask maybe filter 50% of what's coming out and 30% of what's coming in. So they help, but they don't turn, you know, or, or in, in other words, if you put masks on the choir in the model, instead of 52, we estimate them 30 would have gotten infected. So masks help a lot, but they didn't suppress infection completely, right? So I think you need, and some people may have seen this Swiss, Swiss cheese model, you need layers of protection. None of them is, is uh, uh they be all you know so nice people think oh, i'm wearing a mask and it's like a like a you say a, like a silver bullet right and it does no no you need a mask you need to ventilate you need to filter in some cases you need to do things outdoors when you can you need to speak at a lower volume you need to go outside to speak if you can do all these things together and together that's what reduces the transmission right um well, one uh, perhaps last practical question. I realize we're using up our time here very quickly, um, but something that's close to your heart. Uh, does indoor air purifying uh, really help? Is it practical? Yeah, so, so then um, there is three types of air purification that, and we, we have written a paper with all the experts that was published once ago. And we, we recommend filtration. Filters like masks remove the aerosol from the aerosol better filters like MERV-13 in your air conditioning system if you can, or if you buy a standalone filter, then HEPA filters that remove, remove all the virus. This is very effective um, and it's expensive, right? You can also make with a box fan and an HVAC filter, you can make something that does the same thing for much cheaper. So definitely filtration doesn't have side effects. Then for situations when you really need it, like a prison or the emergency room or somewhere like that, um, you can not use ultraviolet light in the ceiling, you know, ceiling mounted, it doesn't hit people in the eyes because it could burn you. But this works very well, it was shown, I mean, this is how we learned that tuberculosis was transmitted through aerosols, it works very well, but it's for a special situations with a professional design installation and maintenance. What we recommend against, and I'm in a chemistry department, but we recommend against air cleaners that use chemistry, that use ions, plasmas, hydroxyl, or um, this one other one um, uh, type, you know, because these ones, they they have chemical reactions that react with the biomolecules in the virus, and that's how they deactivate it. And they do deactivate it if they're well designed, but they also react with abundant volatile organic compounds that are in our homes and make 
monoxidized compounds that are more toxic and they make chemical aerosols, which is kind of pollution. So that you're doing smog in your home. So why buy a box that's, that's killing the air, killing the virus through smog when you can buy a filter that's innocuous, right? So that will be there. And this is all again in the frequently asked questions. So, um, so maybe, uh, and um, is there any any special questions we have? Because otherwise, I would I would ask you again, Jose, uh, if you can put your last slide, where you have your links to your um, your frequently asked questions and a calculator. I think a lot of people would appreciate, it, and I think a lot of answers and uh, could be found there. Um, yeah, um, Adrian, Gian, any any last minute questions? I have, I have one question, which I think a lot of people asked, uh, but was not addressed. If you have a do you have a specific recommendation for what kind of indoor air filters you should you should use? You said what you shouldn't use, but what should you use? Okay, so again, that's that's another question. You should use HEPA filters or filters that you make where, where you literally tape an HVAC filter to a box fan. That is the same thing, but much cheaper. The the only important thing is they need to be big enough for the room, right? So if you have, for example, a room that's twenty five cubic meters. You need a, and you want five air changes per hour. That means you need a, a, a filter that can do 125 cubic meters per hour. You need to do that calculation. What, what I see many times, people buy a tiny filter and then they say, oh, we are safe because we have the filter. No, no, that, that's not enough for what you're doing, right? So you want to filter, you want to be filtering the air many times per hour. That's especially important if you cannot open the windows. You know, if you can open the windows, that's, that's cheaper, but if it's too cold and even with the CO2, you cannot manage then filtering is, is very useful. So I would say, I, I, and yeah, just make sure it's big enough. And it's, you know, like anything, I mean, I have colleagues who test HEPA filters and they tell us that, um, that they, you need, um, I mean, they, that you can find filters that, you know, made in certain countries that, are, that are, don't work very well and they don't seal and they don't filter so well. So kind of like anything, you need a certain quality, which, so you maybe want to go to brands that are, that are known, you know, but I, I haven't tested them myself. But in the in the frequently asked questions, there is links to people who have done tests and they select the specific models um, that work well. Okay. Yeah, that was also questions about you know the um, the air quality meters. <laughs> Any recommendations? But I assume there would be also some links there. Um, so it seems. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, any anything else? Any like finished, Adrian uh, or Jan? Otherwise, I think, Jose, this has been a, another fantastic uh, webinar. I think a lot of really good questions, a lot of good answers, a lot of good data, and I think extremely convincing. And hopefully more people will be convinced to really take care of the way how they should take care. So thank you so much. Uh, at the same time, I would like to invite everyone in two weeks uh, when we'll have the last uh, webinar for this year, uh, but then before we then continue in January. So thanks again and see you in two weeks. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye.